like to say, Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful and beautiful day you've given us. Especially for this opportunity to come together as a spiritual house to offer our spiritual sacrifices and to worship you this wonderful day, my Father. And I pray now as we direct our attention to your holy word that we would uh, listen attentively and hide away and apply these things in our heart, Holy Father, we may better serve you. I pray this in your son's holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, good morning. Uh, it sure, truly is a honor and a privilege to be back here in Athens, Texas. Uh, well, I was telling my parents I was coming back here. I was like, uh, I guess they like me over here. So I, I don't know why, but they keep on asking me to come back. I was like, Harry seemed pretty evident, so I figured I'd come back. But uh, no, it truly is good to be here. Y'all have been very good to me, and especially the Texas school preaching. We truly do appreciate this congregation, all the stuff I've done for us. So thank you so much. But this morning, I want to turn our attention to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. And I don't know if you've ever read Ezekiel, but Ezekiel is not the easiest book to delineate at most times. It uh, has a lot of uh, visions and, and prophecies that some might find confusing, that some often apply to today. But Ezekiel 34 is a plain passage. So Ezekiel 34 is a simple passage that was going to deal with the evil shepherds versus the good shepherd. The first half of the chapter is going to deal with a condemnation against the leaders of Israel, and then it's going to end with a messianic hope of the coming of Christ, the good shepherd. That's what refers to him as David, of course, at the end of this. And the lesson that we want to really look at from Ezekiel chapter 34 and dealing with, it deals with leadership. It's going to deal with leadership in, in every facet of which leadership can be seen. It can be applied to leadership within the home, to leadership to the church, to the leadership of a nation. And any sort of leadership that we see, Ezekiel 34 will apply to that. And so just to give us some context of what is happening in Ezekiel's day, uh, at the age of 25, he was going to be carried away into captivity, as we see in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse number 2. And he was going to be carried away in the second wave of Babylonian captivity. We understand the first wave was 606 B.C., the second wave was 597, and the last wave was 586. And Ezekiel is going to be taken right in the middle of that. He's going to be a captain amongst the river of Chebar. He's now in the land of Babylon. He is now a captive there. And his contemporaries are going to be uh, Daniel and Jeremiah. And Zephaniah would have been uh, fairly close to this time frame as well, just a little bit before. But his present uh, contemporaries would be Daniel and Jeremiah. And there's some references to Daniel also within this book. But when we look at chapter 34 especially, it's going to be broken down into three simple sections. Three simple sections. The first ten sections is going to be a condemnation of the Jewish leaders. And... It's going to point out what they have done wrong and how God is going to punish them by scattering them uh, when they fall to King Nebuchadnezzar. Then the second portion is going to be verses 11 through 22, where God is going to promise to be a good shepherd. He's going to do what the leaders failed to do, and he's going to restore his people after Babylonian captivity. And we see this in Jeremiah, and we know this from Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, that 70 years captivity, then God is going to bring them back. In the third section, verses 23 to 31, the prophecy is going to zoom out. It's going to look towards the future. It's going to look towards the coming of the good shepherd who is going to lead his people. And we can also, we, and when we think about the good shepherd, our mind should go to John chapter 10, should not when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So when we get to the text here in Ezekiel chapter 34, we'll look at the first two verses dealing with the evil shepherds, and we'll look at some principles of leadership. <clears throat> That's the first two verses of read. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. <coughs> prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God to the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. The first thing that I want to notice here is the prioritization of the leaders. And the first thing that God is going to do is he's going to pronounce a woe against them. When we see woe in the scriptures, we don't think of something pleasant. It's in, this is something that is, is being done while he's saying, woe unto you who, who 
prioritize yourselves. You feed yourselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? We're going to come back and look at that some more in a second, but we want to look at a few preliminary things with how this chapter starts. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, the word of the Lord is going to appear three times in this section, or three times in this chapter, and it's going to divide each section as well with this word of the Lord phrase. And we, our mind should also go to 2 Peter chapter 1, and those last few verses there where he speaks of no prophets came from a private interpretation, but holy men say as they were moved along, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so there's going to be a separation here between Ezekiel and the false prophets, because this, this was a problem during this time as well. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 13. False prophets were a problem. But there's a contrast here. This is the word of the Lord, not the word of man. This is not some vain vision. And thus the Lord appears five times in this chapter alone. And in 130 verses in Ezekiel alone as well. Thus saith the Lord appears. But then bring our minds back to this contrast that is being made. Those, that's just some, some academic things we can look at. But, but this contrast being made in this prioritization that these that the principle is set forth that the leaders are not supposed to prioritize themselves. He's saying you're feeding yourselves, you're in a position of power, you're in a position of leadership, and you're taking care of yourself and not my people. We contrast that with the mindset of Jesus in Romans 15, verse number 3, where it says that he pleased not in himself. Who's the good shepherd? And so when we consider this, 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 this simple principle set forth here of you, you feeding yourselves and you're clothing yourselves, and it says, sh sh should not the shepherds feed the flocks? And we see this in 1 Samuel chapter 17 with, with uh, David doing that. When he put his net on the line for his flock, the bear came, he slays the bear. The lion comes, he slays the lion. But see, the and we're going to look further that these men weren't just simply hirelings as, uh, as leaders either. They were wolves among themselves. They were devouring the flock among themselves. But as, when we consider leadership today in these principles, the church suffers when its leaders, when it's supposed to have elders or the men who are in position, when they prioritize themselves and not the flock. And we're going to notice further that these men weren't condemned the sheep going astray. The, the, the sheep went astray. Because even we see Jesus in, in, uh, in his discourse <coughs> with the, I have 99 sheep, but the one is lost. The sheep are going to go astray. But what separates Jesus from being the good shepherd and these men from being evil shepherds is the fact that Jesus went out and sought the sheep. We're going to notice here that when the sheep are in danger, these men do not put their neck on the line to protect them. God's people are being scattered. God's people are being plundered. And the leaders are doing nothing. And these leaders could apply to the, uh, the princes of the time, to certainly the kings of Israel at this time. They had very wicked kings at this time. We consider Jehoiakim and, and Z uh, Zedekiah who were, were kings at this time, and Jehoahaz. And these were wicked kings who prioritized themselves to let God's people be destroyed. And when we consider the neglecting the feeding of the sheep, specific application here to elders, that we see in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, their duty is to feed the sheep. Their duty is to prioritize those things. And the older I get, not that I'm that old yet, but the more I grow in wisdom, the more I grow in knowledge, the more I see the importance of leadership. The more I see the importance of leadership in the church as well. And a lack of leadership is very detrimental to God's people. And that's exactly what's being described here. And let's know as verses 3 through 6, some more things that they, they are doing and they're prioritizing it of themselves and not the sheep. He says, Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe ye with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The disease have ye not strengthened. Neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. Neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Hmm. 
These men were guilty of four times, of uh, four crimes that we'll notice here. We see here, ye eat the fat and ye clothe you with wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The purpose of a shepherd is to protect the sheep, not take advantage of the sheep. He, they just saw the sheep as, as a source of, of intimate, as a source of profit. They were brutalizing the people in this. And when we consider, especially when we get to the governmental application of this, governments could easily fall into this trap where they simply see the sheep as a source of profit. But we still pay our taxes, bro. We're going to stand there. So fair tax. But we, we understand that that can be a mindset that the world gets into, but especially dangerous for the church. I also find that the brethren struggle when it comes to money. Because we're humans. We, we struggle when it comes to our finances. We struggle when it comes time to be a preacher oftentimes. We struggle when it comes time to set forth our money to, to engage in the Lord's work. But that money is not designed for us to put it in the bank and just leave it there. Our money is designed for us to do the Lord's work, but oftentimes, again, coming back to our leadership, they just see the brother, well, you know, we got $800,000 in the bank, you know, we're collecting, we got a whole lot of that, we have to keep that. No, we have to utilize that for the Lord's work, but we see a danger in that mindset, and we can even bring this to the mindset of the home as well, and that it becomes a problem when the leader of the home and the man prioritizes himself over this family. I've learned that the key to being a man is sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That's what we do as adults. That's what we do as parents. We sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. For who? For the sheep. We do not take advantage of those who we are leading. Our goal is to sacrifice and to please not ourselves. This is a principle that we see set forth time and time again. And, both, and we see this Again, them of taking advantage, we consider the Pharisees also were engaged in this Mark chapter 12, verse 40, that they would devour widows' houses. <coughs> Another thing about evil leadership is they take advantage of the weak. They take advantage of the weak. And it's, it's, it's sad, especially when that happens within congregations, this taking advantage of the weak where the brethren are beat down by an older gentleman who maybe used to be an elder, or, or they, they just see him as the, the patriarch of the congregation, as that leader. And then sadly, nothing's going to change in that congregation. They won't grow spiritually, they won't grow in righteousness, they won't grow more and more until that man dies. It's a tragic situation, tragic state to be in, but we see it time and time again. So this, again, the, the purpose is it's not so we can have this, this gloom and doom mindset of, of leadership, but I, I want us to be aware, I want us to be proactive in seeing our leadership and in, in developing our leadership because as leaders, and especially as being a preacher, we covet, we desire the thoughts of the book. We, we desire to prove, we, we desire to be admonished, to be edified, to be rebuked if need be. We desire those things. But we understand the principle of Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 8 that reprove not a scorner unless he hate thee, rebuke a wise man, he will love thee. If you correct me and I get all through my feelings, I'm a fool. But if we can receive instruction, if we can correct one another in righteousness, as we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, set forth there, we're wise, brother. We are wise. We can, we can uh, course correct on our path amongst these things. But come back here to these four crimes that they were guilty of. We saw that they ate the fat, that they ate the wool, that they were a that they devoured. We also see that they demonstrated no concern for the sheep. We see this in verse four, and that when affliction came, when, when the disease came, when the broken bones came, when if we may say when when, when the troubles of life came. I, I want to make this this very clear about leadership. Leadership. Here is not condemned when the troubles came. Oftentimes I find that a problem happens. Oh, it's time to blame our leadership. No problem are going to happen. These men are condemned when the problems came and they did nothing. When our leadership doesn't correct the problem, they don't address the issues, then we have a problem. 
So what does that mean, brother? When we have problems, it doesn't mean we sweep it underneath the rug. We don't pretend like it's there. That's a real issue. That's a, con that's a situation that will be condemned as we see here. But when the issues of life arise, when there is sin within the camp, it has to be dealt with. But we see here that these men were not doing that, and they were guilty of this. But we see further description from the prophets that the disease and, and the troubles weren't just coming from the outside. They were the ones who were destroying the flock. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse number 10, that they were guilty of destroying the Lord's flock. He says specifically the princes and elders were guilty of this. They were destroying God's people. But notice also, in verse number 4, that they wound with force. <clears throat> that they were driving away, and with cruelty have they wooed them. Further commentary on this will be given in Micah chapter 3, dealing with the leaders specifically. If you'll join me, I want us to take a look here at Micah chapter 3, and this, this description of, of what these men were engaging in, Micah chapter 3, and verse number 3. Verses 1 through 3 to, to get a further description of exactly the links that their leadership was going to. And I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and they chop them in pieces as from the pot. And has flesh within the cauldron. The description here of the leadership in, in Micah chapter 3 <coughs> is one, you're, is it not for you to know judgment? Is it not for you to know how to deal with the people? We, we see this prayer with Solomon in 1 Kings, where he says, Lord, I don't know how to lead your people. So give, give, give me wisdom so I can judge properly the people. It, we There's an expectation of of our leaders, that when they are in a position of leadership, that they, they have the faculties, that they have the ability to execute the job. And they, have, and they have the possibility to do it righteously and to do it correctly. But we see here that they lack this. <coughs> and that what they were doing is they hate the good and they love the evil. And the description here is of them devouring the people, of taking the flesh from off the bones and, and absolutely devouring and destroying them and leaving none till the daylight. This is that concept of force and cruelty. And we see further in verses 9 through 10, where he says, Hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. These were some cruel leaders that they had this time who pervert judgment. Perversion of judgment, the polluting of judgment. We don't have any of that happening in our day at all. We see perverting of judgment. Not only we see it in our governmental level, we see it sadly within congregations sometimes. And often I find it has to do with family when it comes to perverting of judgment, when it comes to changing of doctrine, when it comes to, well, that's, that's my nephew over there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deal with that issue. Same issue, same, same issues then, same issues here, for, be it for whatever reason that it is. And also in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 27, God flat out describes these men as devouring wolves. He says, Our princes in the midst of therefore are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Do we not see that first Timothy chapter 6 where there's a great temptation for seeing godliness as gain and the love of money there? <clears throat> We see the same things pervert men today as well. We also know that they were that they were condemned for not getting the flock after they 
and scattered. But they were also guilty of scattering the flock among themselves. As we see in verse 5, and they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Part of the reason that they were scattered is because there was no leadership. And we think about this, especially with Jesus in Mark chapter 6, verse 40, that when he's teaching and he sees the multitudes worrying about, and it says that he had compassion on them because they were as sheep with no shepherd. I think about that so often today as I've been in certain congregations where I walk in there and I'm like, what's, what's going on here? The, the, the brethren are scattered. The, the brethren are prey. Where is the compassion from the leaders on these people? I see this when you just walk about in the malls and the sorts of things. I, I see these, these hosts of people, and you see that they are stooped in the gods, and you say, they have no shepherd. And we wonder where is the leadership, and especially as Christians, we have a temptation sometimes to say, well, where are God? Let me stick my neck up, let me put the, let me put the wall up and separate them from myself. But we have to have the mindset of Jesus in this, that when we see people with no shepherd, we have compassion. We have compassion. And especially with children, especially with children nowadays, that when they get raised by the tablet, that's in front of them. I've seen it with my own niece. It's, it's tough house. It's, it's good fall. So. And so many children are raised like that, and you see the way they act like, man, they, they have no shepherd. No one's leading this child. No one's leading this person. They're going to fall into a dish, they're going to fall into trouble, but where is our compassion in that? Do, do we feel anything for them in that moment? And do we, do we feel anything to the point where we take action, where we actually do anything? Because truly, Proverbs 29 and 18 is still true, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I want to make this clear, the vision there is not a, a foresight, that's not what it's talking about. The vision there is the idea of God's revelation. Where there is no revelation, the people perish. And the, further on it says in that verse that he who keeps the Lord is happy. It goes back to God's word. Where, there is, where God's word is not there, where it is not in the hearts of men, the people will perish. And we see here, and this is a top-down problem. That the leadership is wrong, and the people are wrong, and they're being scattered. Let's make an application here to our government for a second here as well. Often I say, well, the people are bad because the leadership is bad. But the way that our country is set up is the leadership is a reflection of the people. The people who are in office are, well, unless you believe that there's, there was cheating going on in elections. The people in office are the ones that the people <coughs> have chosen. And so it is a reflection of what the people desire. And we also see this in congregations as well. The elders that are in place, the, did the brother not agree to that? Did the brother not know the character of these men? Because I, I struggled with this for a, a long time. I was like, look, how do we have bad leaders still in the church? Bad leaders are there as long as people allow it. As long as the people allow the leaders to, to treat them like this and to stay in this position and to do these things, they were going to be there. So I also encourage us as well that we understand that we have a responsibility to subject the government. I don't talk about the government. The government's going to do its own thing. We see even within the first century that there was a wicked government amongst the righteous people, and God would tell them in Romans chapter um, 15, is it the Romans chapter 15, that they still have to obey the government, still have to submit, they still have to honor the king. We understand that. But when it comes to the leadership of the Lord's church, the leadership of Christ, Bride, we are not to settle for wicked leadership or no leadership at all. We must have it. Otherwise, it would be like in the days of Nehemiah and in the days of Haggai. The Lord's work needed to be done, but the people were standing idle. And you want to know how God motivated them? He sent them a leader and he sent them his word to correct them on that path. But when we see the transition here, Verse number seven. God is going to express his intentions to these bad shepherds. He's going to express his judgments that is going to be upon them. 
He says, Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. Or, yeah, thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I am against these shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will remove my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. We all should hear that. God is going to deal with the situation. He is going to deal with these evil shepherds. Now we understand, going back to the home, the uh, the lack of leadership thereof, and the evil leadership that can that can happen within there, and the <clears throat> evil leadership that will that can exist within the church sometimes, and then those who are placed within leadership within the government, there will be a day of judgment for this, because we understand the concept of, of James three and verse number one, that he says where it says, "Be not any nasty, because you will receive the greater condemnation." And we understand a principle from the scripture that to whom much is given. So these leaders that have enjoyed the benefits of leadership, because leadership is a privilege, is it not? Leadership is a privilege. It is a blessing. But misused, God is going to require this at their hand. He is going to bring upon them judgment. They have fallen into the hands of God Almighty. We see in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 31, that is a fearful thing. But we see here that the judgment upon them was going to be acted out in a swift manner. If you will. They were going to see it within their lifetime. They were going to see God do these things and remove them from their positions and, and this captivity. But for us, we understand that we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ at Corinthians 5, verse 10. Evil leaders may not see the judgment that they have earned upon themselves in this life. They may not see it. They may go to their bed in peace, if you will. But there will be a day, right? Because we have to give an account for the things that we have done in the body. From the least even to the greatest, we all won't have to do that. And being in a position where they were given much, much will be required. There will be a condemnation. And we understand from Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 20, that each man has to give an account for what he has done. Each man has to give an account for his righteousness. Each man has to give an account for his wickedness. And that's exactly what God is going to do. God is just in this. And especially with the application here, or the context here, specifically dealing with God's people. I've heard it also, well, heard you both say this once. Do not go to hell through the church. There will be some who are going to go to hell having gone through the church. They were in the ark at one point. They were in the place of safety. They were leaders of God's people. But they've gone astray. Because we also understand from Acts chapter 20, verse 28 and following, that elders are appointed by the Holy Spirit. And we understand that being through the revelation of God's word. And the first thing that he tells them there is you have to guard yourself. You have to shepherd yourself first before you can shepherd the flock. As leaders, especially as men of the home and of the church, we have to guard ourselves. We have to shepherd ourselves before we can even consider shepherding the flock. We have to get ourselves right and then deal with the body and deal with leading those whom we have. But then we see a transition here verse 11, to the good shepherd. There's going to be a contrast between who God is, what God is going to do, and what these elders have done. And we see this in verses 11 and 12, uh, beginning here. For thus saith the Lord God, we see that transitional phrase here again, Behold, I, even I, will search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep 
and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. From the get go, we see a contrast from what the Jewish shepherds did. And that they didn't seek out the sheep when they were scattered abroad. <clears throat> but God says, well, our sheep are scattered abroad, and they will literally be scattered abroad amongst the nations as we see here for their punishment. He says, I am going to search them out. I am going to seek them out, and I am going to return them. Truly, the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. As we understand in Luke 19, verse number 10, that God has always been in the business of seeking and saving that which was lost. I find it interesting that he applies that to leadership here as well. That leadership has a responsibility to go out to seek and save that which is lost in the secret. We see that, that God being the creator of all men, he didn't leave it to the angels to save mankind. He didn't leave it to mankind to save themselves. He was proactive, you see. His grace came down, that is Jesus Christ, and brought salvation to all mankind. We see God was proactive in that and seeking out all men. And also in contrasting the good shepherd here and leading and taking care of the flock, I might to go to Psalm 23 as well, with David there speaking of the Lord being that good shepherd uh, in a sense there, um, that we'll have to want him, and how he is there, how he's beside him, how he is guarding him, how he is keeping him. That's exactly what God is going to be, and that's, and that's exactly what God is going to do. I've seen Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 10, that he is going to return his people. He is going to, to bring his people back. He's going to have a righteous remnant that he is still going to care for. Because sometimes I think we misunderstand what, what happens when, or what happened when the captivity came. The captivity wasn't a preserving of an unrighteous people. The unrighteous were killed within the captivity. We see a, a vision within the book of Ezekiel that there was a distinction made between the righteous and the unrighteous. We also consider 2 Peter chapter 2 in that, in that last chapter. God says, I know how to spare the righteous and the unrighteous. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he didn't kill Lot too. We see he took out Lot and he destroyed the city. And that's exactly what he's doing with these people here. He's going to take a righteous remnant and bring them into captivity and destroy the wickedness of Jerusalem. He's going to preserve that righteous remnant. They're going to be scattered abroad, yes. But they're going to be brought back. And if I might use uh, East Texas vernacular, God is going to break them from sucking eggs. They're not going to engage in idolatry again once they come back from this. But we see that they divide into sects by the time you get to the New Testament with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the uh, uh, Essenes. So let's look at verse 13 and 14 with further description of how God is going to bring them back. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall they fold feed. There shall they lie in a good fold, and the fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. When we consider this returning of God's people, um, we understand that just as they were taken in three waves, they were going to be brought back in three ways. They were going to be brought back firstly by uh, by Cyrus in 536 BC. And we see this is the time of Zerubbabel. And they're going to reestablish, uh, the, the temple is going to be built at this time. And we said they're going to have a second phase of return in 458 BC. This is going to be under Artaxerxes. Uh, these are kings of Persia. And this is going to be during the time of Ezra. And the law will be reestablished. Then we see the final rebuilding of the walls in 444 BC. This is the time of Nehemiah. And the wall is going to be rebuilt by Nehemiah, of course, and as he is the leader of the people amongst that time. This is about a, a 90, 40 year period of the three returns. And, and within these three returns, God is going to, he, he describes himself as seeing them in a, a good pasture and upon the high mountains. Some of my struggles, especially when I understand that, is that Israel will not ever be returned to their former glory. They're never going to be exactly a, a free people again. They're not going to have a king to rule over them like they had before. We understand that God gave them a king in his wrath, 
and he took him away in his anger on Isaiah <coughs> chapter 13. So how, how is it that he is going to feed on the mountains, and how, how is there going to be a good fold and a fat pasture at this time of the return? They're going to be righteous, bro. It's going to be in a spiritual sense, that they're going to have God. In the <coughs> 70 years of captivity, they haven't been able to worship God properly. When they come back, they can. And we see there that in this return, in this preserving of a righteous people, when we get to Matthew chapter 1 or Luke chapter 1, there's still a righteous priesthood. We see Zechariah, when God chooses to bring forth John the baptizer. We see Mary, they're still right because why? Because the law was preserved. The righteousness was preserved. This is the fatness that is going to be brought back. This is what God has always desired for his people. But also when we bring the application of what, what God is doing here, and that he is seeking, and he is bringing them back to his revelation as leaders in, again, the home, the family, uh, and the world, and the government. When the sheep go astray, that's all about bringing them back to this. It's all about bringing them back to the fold of righteousness. The church is so essential. In order for the church to be a better, or in order for a congregation to be better, the home has to be in order for the homes to become better, they have to get into the congregation. They have to get into the church. They have to get into the book. They coincide with one another. They coincide. The home is so very critical. The home is the foundation of every part of society. And we see this with good men. Good men aren't always raised in good homes, are they? But there, there, there's, there's always something, there's always someone, there's always some sort of leash, there's always some sort of teaching that has to happen of righteousness that must come from that, especially when it comes to the church. There always has to be some leader who comes back to this. And we understand that not everyone who is wicked grows up in a evil home either. Because we understand from James chapter 1 that all men are, script, are drawn away after their own lust. But it certainly helps to have a good home. It certainly hopes to train our children properly to become Christians, to view them as, the, as uh, Psalm 147 put it, as arrows in the quiver. My, my father understood that in a spiritual sense. We, we were arrow, or in a physical sense, we were arrows in a quiver. Uh, I remember on spring break, we stayed home and we got some work done. He, he was shooting those arrows out. Get work done. I uh, grew up in a home with six children, so he, he had plenty of hands to put to work. But we also want to see it in a spiritual sense as our children are can be fellow laborers in the body. It ought to encourage us when our children say, okay, I'm going to raise my son to be an elder, I'm raising him to be a preacher, I'm raising my daughter to be a good Christian woman. I mean, it's, that, that's beautiful to see father and son, to see mother and daughter working together in the Lord's work. That, that's beautiful. But it goes back to what source are we drawing from? How are we leading? Where are we taking the brother? Where are we taking our children? And further contrast to today, verses 15 and 17 here, which says, I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, say the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will feed them with judgment. And as for you and my flock, let us say the Lord God. Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the goats. Something that, especially we see in Ezekiel chapter 18, that these people were guilty of. They were guilty of accusing God of being unjust. They accused God of saying, we're only going to captivity because of the sins of our fathers. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on them. That's the proverb that they're using. And I think this also here is really contrasting that I'm going to judge between cattle and cattle. I'm going to be just in my judgment. I'm going to give each man according to his reward. Further contrast, we'll see some more in verse 18 19. Seems a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture. But ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk the deep waters. But ye must foul the residue with your feet, 
And that's my flock. They eat that which, was, that which you have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus said the Lord, God unto them, Behold, I and I will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Because ye have thrust from the side of the shoulder, and pushed all disease with your horns, till ye have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. We see here showing that, going back to their position of leadership, that these leaders were doing. And that they not only were taking the flock and, and abusing them in the sense that they were destroying their food source, that their life source. This, this is a description here that's being set forth. And we also see this in Jeremiah <coughs> chapter 2, I believe it's verse number 5 or 5, 6, that the, the priests, who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the nation, they weren't asking where the Lord was. We understand that in the time of Josiah, they had five God's law. It, it was missing. And so we found it, and they were, we didn't know it. The leaders have destroyed the source of spiritual life. They stamped upon it, and they have bullied the flock here, if you will, and that they were thrusting, they were using their strength, they were using, they were throwing their weight around, if you will, to keep these people down and keep these people low. And God says, I will save my flock, and they shall no more be afraid. We can also make application to this, to sin, if you will, Romans chapter 6. The weight of sin, how it caused that, that weight, that, that sin is a cruel master. But God delivered his flock, he delivered his people from such things. But we see here in the physical sense of God delivering his people from wicked leadership that were destroying the people. In verse 23 and 31, we see the coming of the good shepherd. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. So we see here, in these first two verses, a transition of God's going to set up one shepherd over them. And he is going to be my servant David. But one thing we understand about David here is that David was just as dead then as he was in Acts chapter 2. Well, Peter says he's dead. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not speaking about David. We understand the prophecy from 2 Samuel, verses, yeah, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 15 and following, dealing with the Lord telling David, I'm going to raise up a seed after you, and he's going to build my house. Now we see the uh, dual prophecy in the immediate context applying to Solomon building the temple, but the further out context here in the in the sense of David, is that Christ is going to come and he is going to be one shepherd and he is going to rule them. He's going to feed them and they are going to know that I, the Lord, will be their God. This is the same idea in Jeremiah chapter 31, where we get the verse 31 and it transitions from the return to God saying, I'm going to make a new covenant, I'm going to make a new law for a new people. And it's not going to be like before. It's not going to be like before where it was a, a physical birth through genealogy of how you became a part of this people. It's going to be through a spiritual birth. God's not going to put up with fathers bearing evil children and say, well, they're still my, he's a Jew, he's Abraham's seed, so I have to carry them along. It's not going to be that anymore. It's going to be the description of John chapter 3 where his children are going to be born of the spirit and of the water. Those are just children now, period. What does that mean? It means that God is dropping off people in the wilderness just like he did in the book of Acts. Same thing being, same thing done then as is being done now, and also in the concept of, of how, just how important leadership is. That God says, "I'm going to raise one shepherd to rule over them, and I'm going to send my son to do it, and he is going to be the good shepherd, and he is going to lead my people." In verse 26 to 29, we see the and bless the blessings that are enjoyed under his leadership, and he says, "I will make them and the places around about my hill a blessing, and I will cause a shower to come down in the season." There shall be showers of blessing. And the tree of the field shall yield for fruit, and there shall yield for an increase. And they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beasts of the land devour them. But they shall sway, they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. 
and I will raise up for them a plant of renown. They shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. I have to make this very clear with this description here and the promises that God is promising to his people. <clears throat> now, number one, we have to say these promises go back to Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3. That, that, promise, that promise made to Abraham. But also, we need to understand the descriptive language here between the heathen and the and the uh, and the beast. Because just like Isaiah chapter 11, so we'll take this to mean, well, this is a, a renovated earth mindset where the, the sheep is going to lay down by the lion, and, you know, so it's going to be, it's going to use that language. But this language is a figurative language of peace, of spiritual peace, specifically. That, that's the application. It's not a, a literal description of a lamb and lion just, you know, laying by each other. And this, this return, that's, that's not the idea here. Especially because to understand what the prophecy means, we all have to do is look at the New Testament and see if it fits. We see that in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. We see that constant. And when, we, when we consider the blessings that we have within Christ, we understand Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 3, that we have all spiritual blessings in Him. All spiritual blessings. Each and every one of them. We understand we've been set free from the bondage of sin and death as, as Mr. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 through 16 that before Christ came, man was subject to the bondage of the fear of death. Why? Because of sin. Well, we understand we have been set free from that. We understand uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 55 to 58 that, that, that death has been swallowed up in victory. That we are no longer slaves to sin. We can live a spiritually free life here so we can live an eternally spiritually free life with God in heaven. This is the idea here in those blessings that are going to set forth. But as we come to a close, I want to look quickly at verses 30 and 31. Thus shall they know that I am the Lord their God and with them, and that they even the house of Israel are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. A distinction is going to be made between physical Israel and spiritual Israel. Israel, as we see in Romans chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. They're, they're, they're going to know that they are, will be my spiritual house. As we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and following, that we are a spiritual house built up for spiritual sacrifice, and we are a royal and holy priesthood. And they are going to know it. And this is the idea here of a spiritual Israel. And the heathen will know that the Lord their God is with them. In the first century, God let this be known through miracles, as we understand. They had the miraculous to confirm the word. You tell that Mark chapter 16. They are going to know that you are Mark. Well, that's John 15. We'll get to that in a moment. But he's telling them that the word's going to be confirmed. It's going to be followed by signs and miracles. But we understand that in Matthew chapter 5, that he says the word, that you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. There's going to be a distinction between you and the world through that. But also we understand 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In John chapter 13, verse 13, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, the, the sign of Christianity is love. That's the sign that God has given to, to forevermore distinguish us from the rest of the world that the world may know that we are God's people is love. The problem with the word love is it's been redefined and changed because we have the authority as men to do that. I like to say that men's responsibility in regards to truth is to discover truth, not determine truth. And so when we discover truth within the scriptures, the thing that separates us from the rest of the world is our priorities. Because men, they agape as well. Uh, men of the world, as we see in John chapter 3, that they love darkness. They prioritize darkness. But what separates us from the rest of the world is the fact that we prioritize righteousness. Now we prioritize one another. We prioritize God's commands. That's what separates us in the world. And that's the sign of the Christian as it, as it ought to be, as God has set forth. So to come to a close here, we understand that there are safeguards that God has set in place for the leadership of his body. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 
in Titus chapter 1 that the qualifications for elders is not God being arbitrary. It's God setting in rules, setting in protection, setting in boundaries to have good and righteous men lead a good and righteous kingdom. So we don't have a repeat of Ezekiel chapter 34. But yet we see we like to get around the thing. We like to, well, he, he's working on it, so we can make him an element. Don't do that, brother. Don't do that. We understand that God is our good shepherd. He still feeds us today through his holy word, and he truly is the good shepherd of the flock. We're going to be chapter 10, verse 11, because he demonstrated the greatest form of leadership, and the greatest form of that is he gave his life for the fold. I appreciate your time and attention this morning. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. Satan does not want us to know. Seeds full of doubt is what he sows. He is the adversary, call on the name of Jesus, follow the way that Jesus shows. God is not the author of confusion, the devil is, the devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible, the truth is his, the truth is his. People will say you cannot know. That is just disbelief they show. I believe Jesus when he tells us that we can know the truth and the truth will set us free. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. The devil is. God he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his. The truth is his. God, he has told us in his word that he has given us a sword. With it expose the arrows, cut fables with a fervor, point to his unity, the Lord. God is not the author of confusion. The devil is, the devil is. God, he has provided in his Bible. The truth is his, the truth is his.